Yes, open me. Uh, open my... Yes, Professor. Uh... Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you, prof uh, Professor. Yes. Yeah, okay. I can hear you and I can see you here. Good. Yes. So uh, let us. I'm sorry uh, that it's such a dark background. Yeah, it's. it's yeah yeah it's okay yes uh so uh from the robotic uh, let us start yes uh, from the robotic surgery academy way today an important event with the professor uh, t sloan guy from uh, usa the expert of robotic surgery and we are uh, happy uh, to meet again and of course uh, after the webinar we will receive your uh, Question, questions on uh, the chat and we can answer you me and the professor in any question uh, because uh, today uh, is the space week uh, and we want to uh, a brief 10 minutes about the robotic surgery academy and after that we will go to the important lecture of our expert in robotic surgery professor sloan uh, next slide please yes. Yeah. So this is the Robotic Surgery Academy, and actually we feel proud to introduce many technologies uh, that are connecting together, uh, and I will explain to you. Next slide, please. So this, uh, this is our specialty, the robotic surgery, and with its many, many and multiple specialties, robotic GIT, robotic oncology surgery, robotic cardiac surgery, robotic urology, or robotic organ transplant. Uh, a collective and international experts is uh, with us in this branch in order to do the training courses and do uh, uh, the uh, mentoring and uh, supervising the robotic programs that we are opening uh, in the region in UAE, Iraq, and many uh, other countries. Next slide, please. Uh, part of our um, specialty is the artificial intelligence in uh, surgery. Next slide, please. And space telemedicine and telesurgery uh, for the International Space Station and uh, Exploration Mar uh, missions in uh, Mars and the Moon. Next slide, please. Uh, the virtual reality surgery, uh, and which is the important in accuracy and doing the surgical operations. And of course, this is uh, the uh, robotic surgery that will uh, today is our lecture on the cardiac surgery. Next slide, yes. And the training courses that we, we will do. Uh, actually, we use uh, the DaVinci SI and XI, and also the robotic surgery simulator. The training courses will be on wet animal labs and robotic simulator, and uh, each specialty with the supervisor that will monitor and train the surgeons. Next. Yeah, so today, uh, and because this week is the World Space Week, and because part of our academy is dealing with the space extra, uh, robotic and the space, uh, tele-surgery and the combination of science and the uh, robots was firstly introduced by NASA uh, in 2000 uh, and after that uh, many revolution has happened and because uh, this is the week of the World Space Week, the satellites improve life, uh, we will give uh, a brief of our technology that we started to offer uh, to the international space stations and the uh, uh, missions of uh, space exploration next slide please so using the technologies that we have done which is a mixture of virtual reality and robots okay that you, and if you have seen the previous operation that we have done between dubai and tokyo uh, which is uh, transforming the human beings or the surgeons uh, in the first time of history uh, to a, a virtual hologram that can do and monitor and mentor surgeries uh, and using whether robots by 5G or 4G, or even giving a tele-mentoring. And the presence will be in the OR like I was there. And we extend this technology to uh, International Space Station and a special program from our Space Tele-Surgery Office from Dubai in order to give the primary health care and telemedicine and tele-surgery in which a special program that will be activated and I can send the doctor to provide the primary health care to the international space stations and or to the uh, Mars or Moon missions. Next slide, please. 
If you can see that in 2020, there are four Mars mission exploration, and all these are uh, has a robots inside, which are the China, uh, the uh, ESA, Rosalind uh, Franklin, and the NASA Mars uh, Reservance, which is a robot, and the UAE Hope, that uh, Mars mission that we are proud uh, in the UAE. These missions has robots, so our technology will combine with these robots with the special headsets and the robotic systems that can give the primary aid care example to uh, the people or to the astronauts once needed. We will see together now a quick two videos about uh, we are working with some robotic uh, co uh, companies in order to improve the technology more. Next slide, please. Maxar designs, builds, yeah. integrates, and tests solutions for Earth observation, so communications, uh, the, uh, space the exploration, as well as on-orbit assembly, servicing, and manufacturing. Arms that can be NASA's Restore Elp will leverage Maxar's 1300 spacecraft platform and nimble robotics to grasp, refuel, and relocate a satellite on orbit. Upon completing the servicing mission, Maxar's Space Infrastructure Dexterous Robot Program, or SPIDER, will demonstrate the on-orbit assembly of a multi-panel antenna reflector and testing to confirm operational status. Next, SPIDER will demonstrate on-orbit manufacturing and assembly using Tethers Unlimited's MakerSat. MakerSat will produce a 10 to 20 meter beam. SPIDER will disconnect MakerSat with the beam and reconnect it physically and electronically to the spacecraft for testing. These capabilities will enable entirely new architectures and space infrastructure for a wide range of missions, including human space exploration to the Moon and Mars under NASA's Artemis program, and more. Find out more about these missions. Yes. Uh, so, uh, okay. So what you saw so together is the robotic arm, and you must know that the uh, International Space Station was built by a robotic arm, which is called Canada Arm, and after that, robotic surgery was introduced. What we saw now, it is a new revolution, which is called robotic satellites, and these sat satellites can repair their cells. And all this technology, it's reflecting back to the human beings and the uh, revolution of the robotic surgery that you can see. Uh, and combining the virtual reality and with robotics, with the telepresence and telesurgery, we reached a state believe me, that we can offer our services to the Moon or Mars mission. Yeah, yeah, oh, uh, yes, open the video. The video that we will see now is one of the HD robots from USA that we are working on to develop a new robotic system. Uh, and of course, uh, it will have a three arms. What you are seeing now is the simulation of the human beings and the tele-surgery monitoring. This can be in the same room, okay, or can be from distance in other country or even to the International Space Station and even to more. Uh, in, to, uh, in 2020, there are many moon missions that will be sent to the moon. Uh, the nice thing with technology that uh, we feel proud to see that the surgery, how it developed, and also the telemedicine and telesurgery in combining all these science together. Uh, and uh, finishing that, I will finish my lecture. Uh, uh, which was about uh, because of the space week, and we will go to our uh, uh, guest and our professor expert in robotic surgery. And uh, I hope we can uh, to, to, to know what is going on about the robots and what is meant by space telesurgery. So, uh, Professor Islam, we are with you, the uh, microphone now with you uh, and with your lecture. Yes, so we gave some action today about the space. So, how, uh, how are you on the state? Huh? Yes. Yes, Professor. Yes, I'm in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Huh? Yes. In, in, uh, in the United States. Yes. Okay. And thank you for having me. What is the audience here, um, Dr. Al? Sorry. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good Yes, Professor, I'm with you. Yes, uh, I hope you mute uh, uh, everyone uh, except you so that we can hear your lecture. Yes. yes, you can hear me okay. Great. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to mute. I'm going to mute. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can uh, hear you. Just to mute the others, please. Yes. Yeah, I did that. Okay, very good. So, um, what I'll do is go ahead and start my uh, presentation. Um, I will say that I found uh, your presentation very interesting, 
you know, the history of robotics was it actually started as a uh, Defense Department and NASA a joint project um, in the United States at a place called SRI, SRI International in Menlo Park, California. Yes. And it was designed to do telesurgery, either in outer space or in a combat, you know, field hospital, uh, which I have experience with. Yes. And um, it turned out to be relatively uh, not useful uh, for that type of environment. Um, but then uh, some very pioneering people, namely Fred Mall, the founder of Intuitive Surgical, uh, discovered uh, the utility of this for minimally invasive surgery. And it was happened about the same time that laparoscopic surgery was evolving. Yes. And um, I think that it's been interesting because Intuitive Surgical has had a relative monopoly for upwards of 30 years now. Uh, and that's about to go away. There are many, many different companies that are um, looking to build robotic systems. So this is an exciting time uh, yes. in, in and, robotics. Uh, Professor, you will see uh, our robot. Uh, I will uh, maybe edit yeah, three right. months. It will be ready. Uh, and I hope you will test it. So one of yeah, the that's uh, very things interesting. is amazing that it. we are building and we are putting the artificial intelligence in it. And very <laughs> reality. Uh, and believe me, I don't want to say unless you see. Okay, so it's yeah, a, I would a, love to, a very nice experience. Yes. I would love to see it. So I'm going to go through my slides now. To, uh, yes. What I'd like to focus on is um, sort of one of the more complicated things uh, in robotics, which is um, mitral valve repair, which is what I do. I'm a cardiac surgeon. Yes. Uh, but I've been doing robotics since about 2001 yes. uh, during uh, the trials for the original uh, intuitive system. And you can see here, with these incisions or these ports here, this is how I currently do mitral valve uh, surgery. Uh, Professor, just see if there is any people to admit, uh, if there is any guest to admit from time to time when you do the lecture, uh, okay? If there are some guests, admit them in the lecture. Yes. You can see it okay? Yeah, yeah I can see I can see you, but uh, there are audience that want to be uh, admitted, yes. Oh, you want me to wait a little bit? No, 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 start, yes. yes. Okay, okay, very good. Yeah. So this is my background. Um, I've primarily been a surgeon in the United States. I have lived in Europe in the U.S. Army, um, but primarily in the United States, in New York, San Francisco, and Philadelphia, and Atlanta. Um, I have a pretty wide uh, background, but I became very interested in robotics for the same reason I became interested in cardiac surgery, is that I like, you know, I like complex machines, uh, like the heart-lung machine, or in this case, the, uh, the robot. Um, cardiac surgery is going to involve large and larger programs, uh, bigger uh, heart surgery cases, uh, complex cases, also what I call boutique surgical cases, uh, such as robotics or, or minimally invasive uh, cardiac surgery, as, a, as an example. There's a lot of very highly skilled older surgeons that will be getting out of the business, younger surgeons that will be coming in. And uh, the training has uh, somewhat declined uh, in quality and numbers in the past few years. So that's going to be a problem, but it's also becoming more team oriented and the younger generations are, are better suited for the team approach than the older surgeons. Um, so that's sort of where robotics sits into this. Um, you know, this is, uh, these are some other, uh, well-known cardiac surgeons, but, um, basically it's a slide to highlight the fact that new technology and new ways of doing things in medicine are extremely disruptive. Um, in the bottom right-hand corner is Dave Adams, the chief of cardiac surgery at Mount Sinai, uh, who does the more traditional sternotomy, is an excellent surgeon and former president of our American Association of Thoracic Surgery. Um, and, you know, of course, he's not going to like it when the Uber driver comes around. I don't know if you, do you have Uber in Dubai? Uber, yes, we have. Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. Uber has been very disruptive. The cab drivers don't like it, right? Yeah. And, yeah, of yeah, course, yeah. you know, a young robotic surgeon comes around Maybe the older person that does it the traditional way doesn't like it. And then, of course, uh, in the top right-hand corner is Vino Thorani, who's in Atlanta at the Piedmont Heart Institute, uh, where he's uh, using transcatheter technology. So very disruptive. You know, there's lots of different companies out there. Intuitive, of course, is on its fourth generation, fifth if you include the single port system. But um, there's, a sm there's a smattering of others on this slide. Verb Surgical was a cooperation between Google uh, robotics and, as, and, and, Ver, and um, I'm sorry, Johnson Johnson or Ethicon. Uh, now it's been entirely bought out by uh, Johnson Johnson, but undoubtedly they're going to be moving uh, places. Uh, Fred Mall, the founder of Intuitive Surgical, actually works with Johnson Johnson on that project now. And I was um, 
I was involved as a consultant uh, for that company. Uh, Medtronic, uh, where I also did consulting, uh, has built a robotic system. Uh, probably one of the most exciting robots is uh, CMR, Cambridge Medical Robotics. And you can see that each arm is a separate robotic system. It's quite interesting. Um, and then, of course, there's others, like the one you're building. Uh, a friend of mine is building one yes. in China. Uh, I, I actually, uh, for us, also, it's a three arm that go together. OK, and right. we have an artificial intelligence memory. OK, and virtual reality. Mixture. So it's, yeah, yes. it will be an amazing piece. So, you know, those of you that are in robotic surgery know that, you know, there's always sort of anti-robot people out there, but none as strong as in, in cardiac surgery. And um, Dr. Adams is, is uh, infamous for having said robotics is essentially a Madison Avenue trick, referring to Madison Avenue in Manhattan. Um, actually, I used to live near there. And uh, he said this in 2016 at the Heart Valve Society okay. meeting. Well, I, you know, I like to say that's what we call fake news in the United States. Uh, which is basically that it is real. We can do it through incredibly small incisions. And I know there's a lot of non-cardiac surgeons uh, in the audience here. Um, the truth is that that uh, cardiac surgeons, while have, tr have traditionally thought of themselves as having a pioneering spirit and cutting edge and brave and technically um, almost superior kind of surgeons, the truth is one of my patients said it best, who was an OB OBGYN, and that is that cardiac surgeons have fallen behind in the in, in innovation compared to some of our colleagues in general surgery, urology, OBGYN, and other specialties. Now, there's good reasons for that. We have to stop the heart when we do our procedures, but there's really no reason, credible reason, why uh, these types of operations cannot be done uh, in more uh, in more centers, other than the fact that there's a lot of cultural resistance. Um, this this is a big part of what's happening in our in our field. In addition to the re, uh, retired. Uh, baby boomer surgeons or older surgeons who are sort of uh, pushing back against robotics. We've also got new competition. Uh, isolated auric valve surgery is now primarily being done with catheter-based uh, procedures um, or aortic valve surgery and mitral valve surgery is, uh, is sure to follow. And we don't know what the role of surgeons is going to be in this. Most of us think that it's probably pretty limited. Uh, some surgeons talk at national meetings saying that we're going to be doing lots of things, but even Vino Thirani, one of the world's experts at this, has said eventually the cardiologists are going to take over all this. So if surgeons, cardiac surgeons want to remain relevant, we have to get rid of the sternotomy operation. Um, the sad fact is that most of the surgeons of the United States and perhaps the world do operations on a daily basis that were largely perfected by 1980. And that's yes. just not going to... So this is why the aim of this lecture, believe me, we want to focus the light. Okay, of the stenotomy of the uh, Middle Ages surgery. Now, that's right. Uh, the, that's there right. must be an end for these surgeries. Uh, one right. of my relative died because of the stenotomy. Oh, I'm so sorry. Myelitis and so. So believe me, it is a serious condition. So I hope. Yeah, no question. Uh, going with the cardiac cut yeah. and the robotic surgery and minimal invasive surgery, uh, we will end this story. And of course, we will need the training of your uh, expertise uh, to uh, other surgeons in order to take on what's going on. Yes. That's right. That's right. So there's a spectrum of minimally invasive surgery. And what I do is completely endoscopic robotic surgery. Amazing. Yeah. Um, this was the old uh, value equation in surgery. That's actually Lyndon Johnson, who was a U.S. president, for those who don't know it, back in the 60s. Um, and, you know, it was all about quality and safety. And the, and the people that trained me early on, that's their entire focus. Today, we have to worry about in a lack of invasiveness, early recovery, decreased cost, and patient experience. And robotics meets all these well. So beyond the hype of robotic surgery, what does it really do for you? Well, for one, it gives you seven degrees of freedom at the wrist. Wristed instruments are the key to robots. So any robotic system that does not have wristed instruments really is not a robot, robotic system. That's where the, that is where the greatest benefit comes from. Also, we get a high definition 3D camera that we can put in close proximity, uh, in this case, to the mitral um, or in the pelvis, to the prostate or what have you. And then we can use small ports, eight millimeter ports. And this slide says 12 to 30 millimeter working ports. We're actually down to an eight millimeter working port currently. Um, there's a lot of data to show that, that heart surgery is safe, cost effective, equivalent or better results, and early and, and as well as early recovery. Um, 
This is the really bottom line when it comes to mitral valve surgery. As you can see really well, this is an actual patient. This is a patient of mine in New York City when I was at Cornell. And you can see the valve just exquisitely well. Uh, you just don't get better than that. And the surgeons in, in the audience know that uh, the real key to surgery is not good hands. It's being able to see what you're doing and visualize what needs to get done. Um, this is sort of the first level of robotic surgery. Uh, Dr. Randy Chitwood was really a pioneer of robotic heart surgery. And um, he designed the operation with a mini thoracotomy with the camera going through the mini thoracotomy and then some robotic instruments. Uh, the next sort of evolution was to separate the mini thoracotomy from the camera port but and do no rib spreading or sometimes do rib spreading in the beginning and then and then stop that. And, and, and the problem with the rib spreader is that, is that it hurts a lot. The, the, the ribs hurt quite a bit. This is sort of the next level where, where you don't do any rib spreading at all and you make a smaller working port. This is an Alexis extra, extra small soft tissue retractor. And of course the camera port is separate. And then I'll show you what I do. This is how we position the patients. This is my current platform. So basically we have four eight millimeter Da Vinci XI ports and a, an eight millimeter air seal port um, and that's it. In this case, we use the Chitwood clamp, which is an air cross clamp to stop the heart. And then bypass, if you look at the top right hand corner, the bypass cannulas are all put in percutaneously. So there's no open incision and the largest incision in the body is eight millimeters, okay? Um, and uh, we also use um, fluoroscopy to put the cannulas in. So the way I like to think of it is this is really two operations. It's putting the ports and all the catheters in and then this, the second operation is actually stopping the heart and doing the mitral valve procedure, which is very doable. This is sort of what it looks like once all the cannulas and, and uh, ports are in and we dock the robot. These are the type of incisions that are possible. And of course, this really would not impress, you know, non-cardiac surgeons doing minimal invasive surgery, but um, really, there's really no other surgical group in the, in the world right now uh, where, where they're using only eight millimeter ports um, at all. Uh, this is um, from uh, a slide from a friend of mine at University of Alabama, which shows how we use the endo balloon to stop the heart. It was on uh, recall for a while, but it's back on the market. It's basically a catheter that comes from the groin to stop the heart. Um, this shows you what po is possible. This patient had a very, um, uh, a very um, uh, large BMI of 56 and um, uh, extremely big. We did percutaneous cannulation as well as the eight millimeter port. And, um, you know, this patient went home in a couple of days. That just wouldn't be possible. Now I'm gonna show you a video. Can you see the video okay? Yes, uh, we can see. So it. here I'm doing cryotherapy to the uh, nerves, to the intercostal spaces. Now we're on bypass, I'm opening the pericardium. There's a big pericardial fat pad. So we remove that with a five millimeter endo balloon or endo uh, bag, uh, we're externalizing pericardial retractors. Here we're using the Chitwood clamp on the aorta and I'm delivering cardioplegia into the aorta. That's the AC aorta coming out of the heart. And I use the robot to put that catheter in. Um, here we get sort of the cockpit view, which is extremely helpful in cardiac surgery. I'm going into the left atrium from the right side of the patient and now you can see the mitral valve. The view is exquisite. Put a little retraction suture so I can see better. Here I'm using V-lock to close the left atrial appendage and of course the Non-cardiac surgeons in this group will not be impressed by that, but I think I'm one of only two surgeons in the world using VLOC in cardiac surgery. Works really well. Here I'm gonna repair the valve. And uh, again, you know, most of you could probably figure this out if I uh, spend a little time with you. Um, but basically uh, here I'm putting what's called a commis commiseroplasty stitch. Um, I did recently drop a needle into the left atrium, which was a problem, but we found it ultimately. And now I'm testing the valve with the, suit, with the uh, suction irrigator. Those are the papillary muscles, and I'm going to put neocords to the valve here um, to deal with prolapse. Testing it again with the robotic suction irrigator, which is a really good tool. You see I have the suture cut um, needle driver, which uh, one of my themes for the last uh, year or so has been to reduce the technical burden to the bedside assistant to make it a less stressful job for them. And uh, here I'm, I'm sizing the valve. I have to use a paper sizer because the regular valve sizers will not fit. And I use uh, a V-lock to place the annuloplasty ring, which again, I think there's only a couple of surgeons in the world currently doing that. 
I use VLOC to close the left atrium. Again, I don't think anyone is doing that. And now we've got to deal with a hole in the aorta. And um, I'm just going to sew that up with a 3.0 proline, pledge it, and then we're going to sort of pump down and, and move on. So I know there's a lot of non-cardiac surgeons on the, on the um, call here today, but, or, um, but just know that this is what's possible. And if you can do cardiac surgery with these type of robotic systems, you can do just about anything. Okay? Yes. So uh, it does require a dedicated team. This is the team that I started out with at um, Thomas Jefferson Hospital in Philadelphia. And uh, uh, we went on a team uh, trip for some training and, you know, really cannot be done without really incredible uh, levels of teamwork and cooperation, which, you know, sometimes is not, is not always the case uh, in, in ORs today. You know, everyone sort of wants to be in charge. Professor, and how was your experience in the cabbage? Uh, the coronary bypass, sir. Yeah, so so I do I do uh, robotic TCAB, so total endoscopic coronary bypass, yes. Um, yes. where basically um, we uh, we sew the artery, the left anterior descending coronary artery to the LAD. If you have and a video for us, we will be happy if you have a video, you know, because I, I just want to tell about the, the anastomosis, you know, because we use this in organ transplant, whether kidney or liver, yes. you know, and of course in the uh, bypass surgery of the heart. You know, the robotic platform here will give you an accuracy and, of course, magnification and the freedom in doing these anastomoses. Yes. Yeah, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of nuances to that. You can just use the robot to take down the internal mammary artery. Yes. You know, or you can, um, or you can um, use it to, um, uh, oh, wait, no, this is the wrong one. Hold on, sorry. Um, yeah, so, so if you have a cabbage for us uh, to see for a few minutes, if you have something of, of uh, your videos of the cabbage, yes. Yeah, okay, here we go. Yes. So, um, you know, robotic surgery requires team leadership. In the case of heart surgery, you've got to be able to use all these catheters. You've got to know how to do the operation, obviously. You have to have robotic skills, um, and you have to have administrative skills. Um, I, I don't imagine that most of you have seen the movie The Godfather, but basically you need the cooperation of administrative, administration, anesthesia, nursing, perfusion, and surgery. And any one of these can kill your program at any time. And I don't think that this challenge is unique to the United States. I've had many international observers come uh, watch me operate. And, you and know, The Godfather is my favorite movie. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. With the music. Well, yes. Yeah. Get, getting cooperation in healthcare is, I think, the biggest challenge in hospitals today. It can be very difficult. Yeah. Uh, this is sort of the setup in the operating room. We have a resident or a fellow uh, at the other console. Uh, this is sort of what the catheters look like. I'm not going to uh, go. Uh, teach professor, you. be ready for us to send some surgeons from Iraq and Dubai and others, you know, to start the programs. Yeah, the absolutely. Uh, and, okay. And of course, after you train them, uh, either in the courses in Dubai or uh, yep. in USA, of course, you will telementer, you know, because I'm using now a technology which is called telementering and telesurgery. When they start yep. surgery, you will be with them. Yes. Yeah, and, and as I think I mentioned to you early on, you know, I have extensive experience in the Middle East. I was in the U.S. Army. I've actually been uh, to Iraq um, yeah. a couple of times and, and uh, Syria and Damascus, you know, a few yeah. places in, in the Middle East. So I have a fair amount of experience. It, it would be a, a great honor of mine to help my colleagues overseas learn how to do this stuff. So here I'm going to show another video. Uh, this is a, uh, a mitral valve uh, procedure. This is a leaky mitral valve looking at an echo. Here, I'm going to skip ahead. These are the ports that I was using at the time of this video, a 12 millimeter port. We've sw since switched to the air seal port. And by, I think I'm the only program in the world using the air seal port currently, but I'm sure if you have a lot of non um, cardiac surgeons that do robotics, many of you have experience with that port. Here, the ports are going into the chest. This is nothing new for you guys. And one of the big differences is port side bleeding is a big problem in cardiac surgery because we give heparin. Here I'm using a handheld ultrasound to get access to the femoral artery and vein uh, percutaneously. Again, I make no open incisions when I do surgery. That's where you get the real benefit of the robot. If you have to make, you know, mini laparotomies or mini thoracotomies, you, you're really not getting the benefit of, of robotics. So in cardiac surgery, usually most surgeons would do a cut down on the femoral artery and vein, and I don't do that. 
So they're, it's all done percutaneously. And here I've closed the left atrial appendage. And again, I'm putting in sort of neocords here. I'll skip through that. These are the same that I did in the other case. Here I'm putting one to the anterior leaflet here that you can see. And then I sort of adjust them and tie them. Now in this case, I wasn't happy with the size of the anterior leaflet. So I took a piece of bovine pericardium and actually augmented the anterior leaflet with a piece of tissue. And now I'm putting the ring on. This is before I converted to using V-Lock to put the ring on. And we're using uh, Gore-Tex. Gore-Tex works very well with the robot, as you know. Okay, so that's, that's kind of an interesting case. And so now I'm decannulating. And these patients go home in between uh, one and three days. This is what's possible. This is a patient of mine from New York City who was literally skiing three weeks after surgery, which would be absolutely unheard of after a standard sternotomy operation. We do have a, um, a large educational effort in the United States. I'm currently the chair of the Robotic Task Force for the Society for Thoracic Surgeons. Anyone that's interested can go to sts.org uh, forward slash robotic cardiac uh, we did have three live uh, symposiums or workshops over the past three years. This year, because of COVID-19, we're actually doing an online course, yes. and we're doing it in six, um, sort of six sessions. The first two sessions have been released as of today, uh, and I think it's a couple hundred bucks uh, to uh, sign up, uh, but it's actually a comprehensive course over about a two-month period, and you can do it virtually from anywhere in the world. So if you're interested, I would recommend that. Um, I also head up the uh, Thoracic Surgery Foundation's Advanced Cardiac Surgery Fellowship Program uh, to train uh, experienced surgeons. Dr. Randy Chitwood, who's really a mentor of mine, heads up the, a similar program for the uh, American Association of Thoracic Surgery. This is sort of how you build a program. You've got to look at prerequisites. Maybe you attend a workshop. You go for training, case observations. Uh, and then mock cases, simulation cases are incredibly important in cardiac surgery. And then to, you go to proctor and track your results and that's how you sort of get success. I myself am a pretty experienced surgeon. I've done over a thousand of these, you know, easily in the top five most experienced surgeons in the world that has done these. My mentor um, uh, in Atlanta, Doug Murphy, is probably up to close to 3,000 at this point and uh, really, you know, excellent results. So with that, I'll be happy to take any questions that you have. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your interesting uh, and amazing presentation, Professor. We are proud of what you are doing, and believe me, uh, a person like you can guide uh, the robot uh, cardiac surgery programs internationally, and I hope we will use your experience to train the surgeons in the Middle East and South Africa. Yes, for the audience, if you have any question, we are ready to answer on the chat uh, by the professor or uh, by me, and of course, uh, we are ready for your questions. Can you open the chat, please? Yes, one question from me, Professor, regarding the time. You know, we saw the less pain, you know, we saw the, uh, the less complication. Regarding the, the time, if you do it in a classic way, the mitral valve or the coronary bypass, and of course, uh, in the minimal invasive method, the time of the surgery, yes. Oh, the time of the surgery, yes. So, you know, one of the criticisms of robotics in general has been that it, you know, takes longer than open surgery. I'm not sure that's 100% true in the hands of a really skilled master surgeon, but it probably takes an extra hour or two to do it robotically in the hands of an experienced surgeon. Now, early on, people take more time, but it basically takes me uh, with, a, with a patient that goes in the operating room around uh, 7.45 in the morning, I'm usually done by about 12.30, 1 o'clock. Um, if I was doing that case open, I might be done around, you know, 1030. So it's, it's, it is definitely uh, faster. I'm a faster if I do it open. On the other hand, uh, that has never been shown to impact uh, outcomes. Meaning if I do a sternotomy, that patient is in the hospital, you know, five to seven days and sort of down and out for six day weeks. Whereas if I do it robotically, uh, most of the patients are out of the hospital within three days about 20% within two days and a small fraction go home the day after. And most are pretty functional within about a week and can return to work in a week or two. Um, 
And the money that the hospital yes. loses by the additional time in the operating room, they make up by the fact they're able to discharge that patient more quickly. Yes, Professor. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, at the end of this uh, webinar, actually, uh, we feel proud uh, of our uh, professor. Thank you for your efforts. Thank you for what you, you have done for you, all your surgeries and the light that you have saved. Uh, and of course, we meet together uh, in other programs. And of course, we want to involve you in our space telesurgery. surgery. Uh, a person like you have a lot of experience in teamwork, and of course, we will discuss this. And uh, uh, we feel proud to have you with our academy. Thank you for our audience uh, to be with us today. And of course, uh, for the interested people, I hope we will make uh, the 